Okay, thank you for coming in pretty much on time. Uh, we'll get started with the next presentation. It's on the economics of resistance management, or show me the money. <laughs> Dr. George Frisrow, Professor of Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of Arizona, will make this presentation. Okay, thank you, Harold. Morning, folks. Wave if you can't hear me. I'll try to keep close to the mic. Um, okay, there's two main economic challenges for managing resistance I want to talk about this morning. Um, one is that while economics is important, economics is more than just farm profitability. Economists think of economics in terms of utility, and I've been warned not to use too much economic jargon, but think of it as households want to have the greatest well-being, and they're going to make decisions that do that. Sometimes those decisions are economic things. Sometimes those are things that people wouldn't characterize as monetary. Um, so households trying to have the, the greatest well-being are going to make decisions that aren't just about per acre profits. While those are important, those are not the only thing. The other thing, issue is that managing herbicide resistance is a long-term issue. It never goes away. It's never going to go away. And it takes long-term planning. And that's also particularly challenging. Another thing I'm going to add quickly is that what David Irvin is going to talk about next is that another challenge is that the effectiveness of managing resistance is going to depend on what other folks are doing as well. Um, okay, first question for you that is, of the following items, which one would you rank as the biggest barrier to farmer adoption of herbicide resistance management plans? One, lack of information. Two, they're too complex. Three, they're too costly. Four, the benefits are too uncertain. Or five, um, farmers have insufficient management time. Benefits are too uncertain wins, but um, kind of an interesting diversity. And I don't think one could argue that you know, any one of those things is unimportant. Um, OK. Now, one of the things, um, when I say it, it, everything depends more on just farm profitability, one of the things one has to look at is overall household income. For most farm households in the US, most of their farm income comes from off-farm income. So you have to look at how uh, their weed management practices and systems, cropping systems, work into the whole household. They have lots of goals. They have lots of constraints. Um, when economists first started to look at the relative profitability of Roundup Ready soybeans, for example, study after study after study was finding there's no profit advantage. But adoption rates shot up. So it was having these benefits that, that economists traditionally were not able to capture. And by surveying farmers, people started to realize that the simplicity of the system, the flexibility, various convenience factors, environmental factors, the way it fit with low-till and conservation tillage were all these important factors that we weren't thinking about. That means that because the reasons for adopting certain things are complex, the reasons to get people to do something different are also going to be complex. Now, another thing, it was interesting when the when Ray asked the question, did anybody think government programs matter? And it was, oh, it was zero. Well, I think people think that the government programs and regulations matter, but indirectly because they're affecting the economics. And farm programs, um, conservation compliance, uh, you know, um, registration of pesticides, crop insurance programs, regular commodity programs, all affect the bottom line, and that's going to affect people's weed management decisions. Okay, now it's a, managing herbicide resistance is a long-term problem. It's an investment problem. You're going to have increased costs today. You might have to buy more residuals, different kinds of equipment, more labor, more training. The benefits are delayed. Okay, you might have better uh, stewardship of the products. Things will last longer. You have more options for more effective weed control over a longer period of time. We know that 
people are generally pretty bad at making long-term investment decisions. Fidelity Corporation just did an analysis of people making investments with their 401ks, and they found the group that performed best were people that forgot they had accounts with Fidelity and just left things alone and didn't manage things at all. So making long-term investments are pretty difficult for people. Another way to think of resistance management is it's an insurance policy. I am incurring, right, why do we have car insurance, aside from the fact that we're legally required to, but you have car insurance, or you have homeowner's insurance, you're, you're paying a certain cost every month to avoid some kind of risk that you can't count on later. One could think of weed, you know, resistance management as the same thing. You're incurring a certain amount of costs, but you're trying to avoid some kind of uh, hypothetical stochastic risk. But that means that the benefits are uncertain. And it's also very difficult for people to weigh costs that they know they have now with the costs that they might avoid in the future. That's a harder sell for people. Okay, question number two. In your opinion, how likely is it that the discovery of a new herbicide will solve current and future herbicide resistance problems? Is it one, high, two, medium, or three, low? I have eight seconds to answer. I think if this question were asked about 20 years ago, it would be flipped around. In fact, I think when people have surveyed growers about 20 years ago, it was flipped around, where historically people thought that we're going to have the next set of compounds um, that are going to make today's resistance problem not a problem. If you look at historically, the cost of herbicides relative to other ag inputs has not risen as fast. Um, and I think there's been a change. I think one of the things that's come out of a lot of the efforts uh, that we've been doing over the last few years is people start to realize that the effectiveness of herbicides, in particular modes of action, um, that they're limited and we, it may be increasingly difficult to get new ones. Okay. Um, It'll go through different cases in going back to income. So what's the long run income uh, implications of resistance management? I'm glad to see Bob Nichols from uh, Cotton Incorporated here because once upon a time we were uh, uh, brainstorming at one of the Beltwide Cotton conferences and we were talking about three scenarios uh, of resistance management and there were three cases and one is what I call the optimistic case is that managing for resistance is profitable even in the short run. So then the issue is, well, why wait? We can do it. Intermediate case is, well, you may have to be doing things that re re reduce your profits in the first few years, but pretty soon the net effect is positive because your system is in place, you're avoiding future resistance problems, and resistance management, quote unquote, pays for itself after just a few years. You could think of this as you, know, you can buy more energy efficient washing machines or energy efficient dryers or, or appliances. And those energy efficient machines are a little bit more expensive, but you save on your electricity bill, so in the long run it pays off. And if you can actually, you know, I think they, they report in some of these how long under regular use it would take to pay for itself. And that's an important thing to think about, and I think an important thing to try to tell growers. Um, the other thing is the, pe the pessimistic case is that even after you know, a fairly long number of years, resistance management may not be um, that profitable, it may not seem profitable, or the benefits that people see are so far in the future that people really start to discount things that they think they're gonna t it's going to take a long time for them to get. So here's case one. So um, what what these green bars are, think of this as like dollars per acre, your net return from doing certain resistance management practices, let's say relative to completely ignoring resistance. So this is, this is kind of your net gain per acre, and I purposely don't have any you know, specific units on here. But here's a case where, oh, doing resistance management pays right from the get-go, and you know, the benefits you know, keep going up. Um, 
And so you should you know, probably you get gains right away. So you should probably just do it right away. Well, here's a case where resistance pays for itself relatively quickly. In this particular example, it's, it, you might be giving up some farm profits the first two years, uh, putting in the resistance management practices. There's no difference by year three. By year four, you're better off because your long run returns are, are higher after year four and, and henceforth. Okay, so resistance management is initially costly, but it starts to provide net gains in later years. And you can actually add up, this is kind of discounted, you know, over time. Um, you could kind of look at, well, at what point do the gains outweigh the, um, the losses? And, you know, it's a real difficult economic calculation. It's like, well, when is the area of the green bars bigger than the area of the red bars? That's, that's when the thing has paid for itself. Um, and so I think that's what people want to know. It's like, if I start to do these practices, you know, one, am I, going to lose, am I going to lose money relative to what ignoring the problem? And if I deal with the problem instead of ignoring it, how long does it take for it to pay off? And here's a case where resistance management would only pay off after quite a number of years, where people have to kind of forego a certain number of profits for a fairly long period of time. So it could take, you know, in this particular example, it could take 11 years before it pays for itself, and this is a completely made up example. Okay, now there's different policy implications for these different cases. Case one, resistance management pays for itself right from the get-go. Well, okay, this, this, is, this is what you would call the no-brainer. It makes sense to be doing this now, so people should just be doing it now. If that's the case, then we need to identify where those cases are as much as possible and wherever they are. And this is where traditional you know, demonstration extension uh, and education is going to suffice. I think you, if you're able to communicate to growers, hey, this makes sense for you today, and, and they believe it, if, again, the results that you're presenting are clear and convincing, they're not stupid. They're going to do what, what makes economic sense. Case two is a little harder. It takes a few years to pay off. So simply just providing information, people have to start to do kind of calculations. Well, how many years is this going to pay? How long is it going to take for me to rec recoup my investment? Um, you know, a lot of growers have sh more, more short-run economic stress. If, they're, if they can't afford some extra costs right now, if they're not thinking about staying in farming very long, uh, if they have plans to sell or develop their land within a couple of years, well, if I'm if I've, um, planning to sell my land, or I come from Arizona, where a fair number of growers have already sold their land, and they're leasing it back on an annual basis to uh, you know, people who bought it for real estate development, your time frame may be very different. So there might be selected groups that are going to be much harder sells. Case three is a lot more pessimistic, where the messaging is really difficult. You're telling people that this is going to eventually pay off but it's a, it's a longer term. And so you might need additional economic incentives, additional cost sharing programs, you know, something like an a equip type program to get people to put these practices in place so that to get them over that hurdle of, of having to wait or having uncertainty about the benefits. Okay, now we have a critical need because I've got three hypothetical graphs. What kind of reality do we have here? There's different kinds of policies and the amount of intensity of things we would have to do to create incentives for growers uh, to adopt these practices. We really need to know what these actual bars look like. You know, like what does this look for corn? What does this look like for soybean? What does this look like for cotton? What does this look like for corn, soybean, or cotton, soybean rotations in different parts of the country? What we need is these numbers actually filled in in dollars per acre so growers can see. Um, and I think work is, is being done, I know, at USDA to, to provide us with this, these um, exact kinds of numbers, and I think it's going to be very important when that comes out. Okay, some call to actions. Reduce regulatory barriers to herbicide resistance and management. That's fairly general. What I think kind of specifically is we have a new farm bill. The new farm bill has a whole host of different kinds of 
crop insurance programs that are replacing our new or older traditional commodity programs. We have conservation compliance, which regulates what people can do on highly erodible land. We have the CRP, which allows people to you know, retire land. And so it's a question, can, what about these programs are encouraging resistance management? What about these rules and these programs maybe you know, discouraging it? Are there things that have to do with uh, conservation compliance, which may be preventing people from doing supplemental tillage that they need? Are there new technologies for tillage that, that avoid the problems that conservation compliance is supposed to remedy? Um, there's a whole host of different yield and revenue kinds of insurance, and so the question is what incentives and disincentives do they give for um, resistance management? I don't think that's something that we've you know, given enough attention to. Um, the other thing is we need to communicate the effect of resistance management on short and long-term profitability. I think farmers need to know what is this, what's the bottom line? What is this going to do per acre? What is this not going to do per acre? Again, with my experience in cotton, when like BT cotton came out, there was a host of studies that came out that showed, and they would get, do presentations at the Beltwide Cotton Conferences about, oh, well, here are the returns to BT cotton versus conventional cotton. You had things for different kinds of varieties, different comparisons over all these different states and production systems. Um, I think we need the same type and level of information for uh, you know, people adopting resistance management practices. Um, again, you know, there's a lot of short-term short financial incentives that can reduce the cost of developing and implementing field-by-field field herbicide resistance plans, you know, something like EQIP um, or other kinds of cost-sharing programs. Could they be structured in such a way that actually um, get people to be adopting um, resistance programs that they wouldn't otherwise be. I'm done. I would entertain any questions that people might have.